if Jesus is the one whose blessing we need the most, and he is, and he's the one who can do it, and then he knows better than anyone else how life is really blessed. In Matthew chapter 5, when he describes life that is really blessed, he begins with the most surprising brushstroke, at least until you get to the end of his picture, and it's just as surprising. I want to read all of the Beatitudes this time to get to the last one, which we're studying together tonight. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now let's just stop right there and think about where we have been already in this study. To sum it up, if your life is going to be really blessed, you're going to have to get right with God. And you're going to have to do good to people. And then you, you can expect that God is going to do right. But then Jesus comes to this part where he says, Don't count on people being good to you for all of it. Verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kind of life that's really blessed is different, and it's not really easy. But Jesus knows that some people hearing him are going to think that it's worth it. I want you just to review with me really quickly in the verses that we've already read, the first three words of each verse. Beginning of verse 3, blessed are the, blessed are those, blessed are the, blessed are those, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are those. Jesus says in verses 3 through 10, but not in verses 11 and 12. There he says, blessed are you. Blessed are, are you. Jesus believes that some people who are sitting there then and who are sitting here now, who hear what he says, are his disciples and others really want to be his disciples. They believe that it's worth it. And so he's talking to you if you're one of those people. Verses 11 and 12, blessed are you. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed life is not what everyone thinks it is. It's, it's not according to conventional wisdom. It's not about ease. And all your days be merry and bright. But Jesus knows some people are listening to him and believe him. Are you one of those people? So that Jesus could hear at the end say, Blessed are you. Now the blessing finally lands on people, Jesus says, who are willing to be persecuted for righteousness sake. Let's admit a reality that we know just from knowing people maybe even looking in the mirror. Some Christians are real jerks. I see the looks on your faces. You, you know I'm right. You don't want to say amen after somebody says that, but you know that I'm right. While Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 tells us that a, a fully functioning and united church and mature Christians speak the truth in love, sometimes even if people can hear some truth, they don't see any love. And they don't see it because it's not there. The Christian who is noisy with the truth is noxious without love. 
People aren't going to want that truth. People aren't going to embrace that truth. And they're not going to feel good about the person who's bringing it to them. And so things happen, and that person who at least thinks he has the truth or maybe even has some truth feels persecuted. But that kind of person doesn't get Jesus' blessing, not his endorsement. From Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. The person who is blessed in persecution is suffering for righteousness' sake, Jesus says in verse 10, or on his account in verse 11. Sometimes people react to us negatively for things other than our righteousness, and rightly so. In 1 Peter chapter 4, we find one of the three times that the Bible uses the word Christian. If you suffer as a Christian, well, glorify God that you bear that name. But in the preceding verse, 1 Peter 4, verse 15, Peter says to Christians, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Should you expect opposition if you murder someone? Well, of course. Should you expect opposition if you steal from someone and get caught? Yes, won't you have to pay for it in many ways? An evildoer, as Peter called, is bound to cross paths with those who won't let him get away with what he does. So you think about those three things and you say, I don't murder, I don't steal, I don't think you'd really describe my life as an evildoer, but did you hear that other word that Peter stuck in there? If you suffer as a meddler, then you're getting just what you ought to expect to get. Being even a, a meddler, sticking my nose where it doesn't put me at uh, where it doesn't belong will, will put me at odds with people and put me in the wrong. The Holy Spirit says, don't suffer that way. Just having somebody mad at me does not place me under the umbrella of blessing in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Even if I'm a Christian, sometimes I deserve the displeasure of others. But Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, and blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Let's think for a little while then about what gets people persecuted with God's blessing as a result. Jesus says it's by doing what the prophets who were before you did at the end of verse 12. Let's just think a little bit about one of those prophets, Jeremiah. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 19. And we'll read from three or four select passages in this long and compelling book of Jeremiah. Chapter 19, verses 14 through 16 is is one of the spots where we find Jeremiah doing what God told Jeremiah to do. Jeremiah 19, verses 14 through 16. Then Jeremiah came from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm bringing upon this city and upon all its towns all the disaster that I pronounced against it because they have stiffened their neck, refusing to hear my words. So for a long time, God had been giving his word to these people. And he told them about obedience and the blessing that follows. And he told them about disobedience and the curses that would follow. But they just stiffened their necks. They wouldn't listen. So here's Jeremiah with the word. Here's Jeremiah to convict them for it. Here's some of the response in chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Now, Pasher, the priest, the son of Emmer, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Pasher beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. You think about that situation. Where is Jeremiah preaching the word of the Lord? 
The Bible says that it was at the gate of the house of the Lord. To whom is he preaching? The people of the Lord. And who's really upset with Jeremiah for doing it? It's the priest of the Lord, Pasher, and he beats Jeremiah for it. Turn over a few chapters to Jeremiah 26. Jeremiah 26, and we'll read a little more this time, verses 1 through 15. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 26, beginning in verse 1, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship in the house of the Lord. All the words that I command you to speak to them, do not hold back a word. It may be that they will listen, and everyone turn from his evil way, that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do to them because of their evil deeds. You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, If you will not listen to me to walk in my law and I've, that I have set before you, and to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets whom I send to you urgently, though you've not listened, then I'll make this house like Shiloh. And I will make this city a curse for all the nations of the earth. Shiloh had been a town that, that was the center of religion among the people of Israel a long time ago. Not anymore. I'll make this place Jerusalem just like it. Verse 7, the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves the sentence of death because he's prophesied against this city, as you've heard with your own ears. Verse 12, Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the words you have heard. Now therefore mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will resent, relent of the disaster that he pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me it seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. Why am I here? What am I doing? I'm doing what the Lord told me to do. I'm saying what the Lord told me to say. And they hear the judgment from his mouth, but they don't want to believe it. They're hearing grace from his mouth, but they don't want to listen to any part of that. Can't believe that they'd have a need for something like that. And so they're all angry with Jeremiah. And on this occasion, there were a couple of different reactions. Some of the people hearing cited the, the precedent that had been set by Hezekiah who responded favorably whenever Micah had come preaching a similar message. Others reminded the crowd of a, a prophet named Uriah who prophesied in words like those of Jeremiah. He was pursued to Egypt by King Jehoiakim. Verse 23 says that that king struck him down with the sword and dumped his dead body into the burial place of the common people. Now this time, Jeremiah was not handed over to the enraged people. But his unrelenting faithfulness just kept him in hot water with people all the time because they were uh, more self-absorbed than eager to hear what God had to say, what God's will was. Turn over a few more chapters to Jeremiah 38, and we'll read six more verses in this book. Jeremiah 38, verses 1 through 6. Now Shephatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, 
Jucal, the son of Shalemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Then the official said to the king, let this man be put to death, for he's weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in this city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man's not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he's in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. That's, that's the career of Jeremiah capsulized. Doing what God wants him to do, saying what God wants him to say, only to hear even religious leaders among the people saying, this guy's not for the welfare of our city. This guy's not good for us. And nothing could have been further from the truth. Jeremiah told the truth, and he told it in love. He's been nicknamed the weeping prophet. Jeremiah didn't come to these people all mad about all of this. Persecution did not break Jeremiah, but it all broke his heart. And he's the kind of man in whose footsteps Jesus said, we walk whenever we're persecuted for righteousness. It worked the same way with Jesus' early disciples. He said it would. I'm going to read from John chapter 15 if you want to turn with me there now. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. This is one of the... Many important things Jesus knew he had to tell his disciples on this night that he would be betrayed. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? A servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Was Jesus persecuted? Yes, he was. All the way to his death the next day after this. And what Jesus said proves true whenever you open the book of Acts. And the apostles preaching the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ first encounter opposition from their own people. And as it continues, they, they encounter opposition from governments in various localities. And they encounter opposition from the populace who felt threatened by the message that they were preaching. And the book of Revelation, too, shows that Jesus knew what he was talking about. We go on beyond Scripture and we read about what was happening in the first few centuries of the life of the church. And we read a lot of horror stories of things that happened to those Christians who were found faithful we can point to things happening to Christians today that are just awful. But brothers and sisters, let's remember what comes out of what we're reading from the lips of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. The most important thing, the most important thing is not to stand up for our rights that we have enjoyed, but to stand up for Jesus to live for Jesus and to talk to people about Jesus. We have a real tendency to get caught up in boohooing threats 
to the right to do more than we're really willing to do a lot of times. As you go back to Matthew chapter 5, notice this. The only outright commandment in Jesus' whole description of the life that's really blessed is this. When you are reviled and persecuted and charged with all kinds of evil falsely on Jesus' account, rejoice and be glad, said Jesus. Now, if everything else that Jesus has described is the way your life can be described, then when you're persecuted, well, that means you're doing it right. That means God is glad about the way that you're going about life. You have His approval, His endorsement. You're blessed. So what is it that causes God's blessing to fall, according to Jesus in Matthew 5, 10 to 12, it's perseverance through mistreatment that results directly from your faithfulness to the Lord and His Word and other people's opposition to it. That's where God's blessing falls on people who are persecuted. It is great. It has been great. And we pray that we will continue to enjoy the great blessing of having the freedom to do what God wants us to do. But the blessing comes from doing it no matter what. No matter what anybody else thinks. No matter what anybody else says. No matter what anybody else does to us. But let's think uh, as a final portion of this lesson about why do people persecute others who preach good news, who live good lives, and who act with good will? Why would people do that? Jesus explained in John chapter 3. If you'll turn there. We just read in, in John chapter 15 that Jesus says, If they persecute me, they'll persecute you. In John chapter 3, we can read, beginning at that verse that we love so much, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him, verse 18, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus explained it, didn't he? God loves the world. God loves everybody so much that he gave his only son for our life, not for our condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but did a lot of people feel condemned in Jesus' presence? They did. And it was people, Jesus said, who loved darkness more than they loved light. And Jesus says people won't come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. I want to keep being the way I am. I want to keep doing the things I'm doing. And I don't appreciate you throwing a spotlight on the nature of those things and on the nature of the person that I've become, I don't like that. And so they don't like Jesus. And Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. When we are, are good-hearted people, we read the Beatitudes, and, and it breaks our hearts to see how lacking we are spiritually. And we want to live that life that Jesus says is blessed. But, but when we live that life and people read those Beatitudes then through us, really, with an evil and unbelieving heart, they encounter someone who's living the blessed life, who wants others to do it, and it only awakens anger 
against anyone who would have them to restructure their lives for good. As Jesus finishes up this painting of this blessed life, he's not telling us to go looking for persecution. He just says, blessed are you when? When it happens. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil things against you falsely on account of my name. It's just the way things work. We should expect it. When, not if. As Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Indeed, everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Just expect it. But equally more, equally or more, we ought to be confident in God's blessing. You might encounter persecution and, and you wonder, why is God letting this happen? God must have something against me. But this final word from Jesus about the life that's really blessed suggests that just the opposite might be true. Why is all this happening to me? Because God endorses the life that you're living. God endorses the things that you are saying. They're what Jesus said and did. And that's what God likes. So the life that's really blessed, it's not a stoic life. It's not a passive life. Jesus teaches us that his disciples engage other people they are out there where, where people can see them. They're doing good. They're doing right. And, and people go, are going to react one way or the other. They're going to react for better or for worse. They might know that, that through you, God is blessing them. But on the other hand, there might be friction. They might want what you have and ask for more, but they might feel condemned and strike back. It makes no difference in whether you will keep doing what you do as a faithful disciple of Jesus. You'll keep following in the footsteps of the people whom God has always approved. You will be glad and rejoice. Your reward is great in heaven. You belong in the kingdom, and the kingdom belongs to you. You're really, really blessed. As you think about everything that Jesus said in these Beatitudes, are you one of those people? Are you his disciple and are you going to be his disciple no matter what? That's the way Jesus wants it to be. We'd urge you tonight, if you haven't become a disciple of Jesus, to learn from him about your need for him and about what he requires you to do to become his disciple. As this book of Matthew ends up, he reminds us he has all the authority. And we become his disciples when we learn this truth about him and, and we're baptized. And then we grow as his disciples as we keep learning and doing everything that he wants us to do. Are you his disciple? And if you've become his disciple, are you still going to be his disciple no matter what? We'd love to help you become a disciple tonight. We'd love to pray for your faithfulness as a disciple. If you have those spiritual needs, we're singing this song to encourage you. You can come to the front now as we stand and sing.